think of uh, one particular uh, camper that was part of our camp program, and you know now she is off doing manatee research in Florida, and she's uh, on her way to her PhD. My first introduction to SeaWorld was a visit um, just with my family, very young kid. That is what really encouraged me to want to get involved with the animals. I've always been interested in animals, but the foundation I got here at SeaWorld really put me on a path towards marine science that I, I don't know that I necessarily would have hit otherwise. After college, I'm probably going to pursue a degree in either biological oceanography or in um, marine biology. So a pretty big impact overall. I currently have a mentor student that uh, came in not really knowing what a coral was. She wasn't really that familiar with it. She's just enjoyed it so much doing her weekly research that I think she's really been inspired to uh, want to conserve coral reefs and maybe even steer her career in that direction. Our camp program started 15 years ago. Imagine kids back in high school 15 years ago have already gone on to college, finished college, and now they're in their career. So they're seeking out their career and this is, for a lot of them, this is their career, and I'm so pleased to see these kids come back. It's kind of a, a full circle feeling for us, um, and it, it's great. Yeah, iPhone 4. These animals impact the people that come to see them. They change them, they move them, they make them stop and think, they make them laugh. They make them cry. Okay, We're here to educate battery. people about the animals. If they walk away from here and they've had that amazing vacation moment where they've been able to interact with the animals or learn something about the animals that they can share with, with their families and make that lifelong memory, to me that's what, what it's about. These animals, they are ambassadors. They are ambassadors not just for their species, but they're ambassadors for the aquatic world. They're ambassadors for the ocean. They're saying, take, stop. Stop and take a second and look at the environment I live in and make a difference. Make a difference for me and my family and my species. Make a difference for all these other animals. And think about how many people we affect on a daily basis. Each show, I mean, we hold 6,000 people per show. So it, even if you affect one person per show, when we're doing seven shows a day, that's seven people a day that you can ultimately change their life. How amazing is that? Each parent plays an equally important role, so we can relate. It all starts when it's time to nest. Where they make it, how they make it, and what they make it of differs by species. Some dig into the thick layer of bird poop, better known as guano, that coats the rocky shores they call home. Others carve out a spot on the sandy beach. While these guys let Mother Nature do the digging, plopping down into an existing depression or crevice in the rock. You've got a few that build a small wall of pebbles and stones. While forest-based penguins find a safe, secluded spot to set up shop. But the two biggest penguin species, they are the nest. While every other species typically lay two eggs and warm them in the nest they build, emperor and king penguins only lay one, and they incubate them on top of their feet. Since it's too cold to rest the egg on the ice, the egg is kept safely off the surface. And nice and toasty beneath a flash of skin called a brood patch. Keeping that egg safe and warm is a responsibility both parents share. Except that is for the emperor penguins. Female emperors head off to hunt for the entire incubation period, stuffing themselves full so they have plenty to regurgitate for their newborn chick when they return. That means the male emperors have to keep that egg on their feet for approximately two months, all looking nothing. 
Now, incubation may seem like a lot of sitting around and doing nothing, but there is plenty that can go wrong. Emperor and king penguins can lose their egg if it falls and breaks during transfer between mother and father. For the other species, unguarded eggs are in danger of being snatched up by seabirds, foxes, dogs, cats, rats, and sometimes even human poachers. But in most cases, all goes according to plan, and you get this. Those super fine down feathers serve two important purposes. Yes, they provide warmth, but they also set chicks apart from the adults. So it's clear to all, these are young ones in need of special care. And that's a good identifier, because chicks really are helpless. Many parents lose one of their two chicks to illness or predators. Those that survive depend completely on their mother and father, until they grow their waterproof feathers and are able to hunt for food on their own. But again, cooperation is in full effect. With every penguin species, the parents take turns. One stays with the chick, keeping it safe and warm, while the other hits the water to hunt, bringing back the chick some delicious regurgitated food. And who doesn't like regurgitated food? <laughs> and though penguin parents hunt only for their own chicks, some cold weather species band together for security in nursery life groups called a crash, which means crib in French. Wee oui, wee! Oui. That crash helps protect those chicks both from the elements and predators. For Antarctic penguins, many predators are other birds. Sometimes working in pairs, they will swoop down and steal the chicks that have strayed from the crest. One bird, the sheep bill, has even been known to dive bomb in, nabbing the regurgitated food just as the chick is being fed. Birds are a big threat to penguin chicks in temperate climates too. Plus, they have land predators to contend with as well. So it must be a relief when their chicks finally lose their down feathers and grow some sleek waterproof ones. It's a process called fledging, and it means the chicks are now, finally, able to swim. Which means they can go get their own food, which means the parents won't have to hunt for two anymore. Which means, for most penguin species, the message is clear. Learn how to hunt, Junior. And they better learn fast, because water is where they're going to spend most of their lives. for over 25 years, and I don't know another person on this planet that loves animals more than Julius Gardena. Yeah, you are so cute. Julie is always looking for new ways to inspire a conservation spirit in everyone she meets. We have some fantastic animals from our SeaWorld and Bush Gardens parks, and hey, wait a minute, we're shopping them all down. do to help these critically endangered species and that's really the main reason for bringing these guys out this is absolutely my dream job i do get a chance to perhaps make a difference in the world ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us for wild days at SeaWorld. please help us welcome to the stage SeaWorld animal ambassador curator conservationist TV personality and author, Julie Scardina. Great to see everyone here for Penguin Lovers Weekend. That's awesome. We're going to focus 
nice on these little guys. But we're also going to show you a little bit of, uh, or have a couple of other cool, fun birds as well to show you. But at the, oh, Keith's like, where's Penny going? Where's Penny going? <laughs> All right, there you go. Go run after Penny. Uh, at the end of the show, you guys, I have a very special penguin surprise for you. So don't leave before the end of the show. All right, well, how many penguin lovers do we have in the audience? <laughs> species this is? Magellanic. That's absolutely right. Good for you. Hey, wait a minute. We have a star in the audience here. Did you guys like that penguin video that you saw? Laura and McKenna right there and TJ actually starred in that. So great to have you guys here with us today. You guys did a phenomenal job. All right. So Laura, no more answering penguin questions. <laughs> All right. So, um, how many species, not Laura, of penguins are there? Does anybody know? 18. 18, very good, that's awesome. They range in size from the large emperor penguin, which stands about three feet tall, to the tiny fairy penguin, which is found off of New Zealand and Australia. These guys are found off of South America. So while the Antarctica cold weather penguins have to survive the windiest, coldest, harshest environment on Earth, they're all adapted to be able to do that. These guys, the Magellanic penguins, since they live off the coast of South America, Chile and Argentina, the Falkland Islands, they have to be able to withstand both warm and cold temperatures. That's actually a little bit harder because, you know, they have to have both types of adaptations. So, in order to stay warm, one of the things that penguins do, uh, well, they're well adapted because they have more feathers per square inch than any other bird. And if they want to cool off, which the Atlantics do, they have a patch of featherless uh, area right by their beak, right by their eye. You might be able to see it there. And that patch actually allows them to dissipate heat. And when they are hot, that patch will get red. Just like when we flush, we're dissipating heat from our body. So we get rid of that heat by having the vessels at the surface dilate. They can do that. Another way to stay both warm and cold is to have your own little house, right? Who all here lives in a house? Okay, good. Because they have to build their own house. It's called a burrow. They use their feet and their beak to kind of dig into a burrow underground, sometimes in their own guano even, which is why it's important to keep the native habitat that they live in intact because they actually do burrow into that guano because it's a nice consistency. But they dig a burrow so that they can protect themselves both from the harsh weather and from the uh, warm weather as well. And if it really gets hot, there's always one thing you can do, right? Who goes swimming when it gets too hot? Yes, we all like doing that, don't we? So that's how Pete and Penny kind of survive both of those extremes. But you know what? JT, uh, I'm sorry, TJ and Laura are our penguin experts that are with us today. It's because they have this expertise that we've been able to help penguins, not just the ones that we care for here at the park, but to help penguins around the world in need. And one of the biggest opportunities to be able to do that was for a huge oil spill off the coast of South, America, South Africa in the year 2000. And I have a little video that tells you the story about the treasure oil spill. Some people might think Africa is an unlikely place for penguins. But the southern tip of the continent is home to a fairly large colony of African penguins at least by today's standards. Like most other species of penguins, the African penguin numbers are in decline. Less than 10% of the original African penguin populations remain. June 23, 2000 marked a tragic day off the coast of Cape Town, South Africa, when an ore carrier called the Treasure developed a hole in the hull and sank six miles offshore. Two of its fuel tanks ruptured, spilling over a thousand tons of oil, and the resulting slick quickly hit Robin and Dassin Islands, both major breeding sites for African penguins. And to make matters worse, the spill occurred in the middle of the penguins' breeding season, putting thousands of birds at risk. This was to become the biggest evacuation and rescue attempt of wild birds in history. See 
world was one of many to respond to the African penguin disaster, sending two of their aviculturists halfway around the world to offer their services. It was a long haul for both the animals and the people, but in the end, a remarkable contribution to penguin conservation. And you know, believe it or not, all 20,000 penguins, as well as 700 chicks, that up until the time when our aviculturists went and said, you know what, we've raised chicks before, we can help rescue the chicks as well, because people didn't know what to do and how to raise those chicks until we had zoological experts go there and say, we can help. Those chicks were monitored and tracked, and it is found that the, uh, that the survival rate for those chicks was super high and that since then they, they've had, they have had chicks of their own. So it was a fantastic effort on behalf of many people around the world, but specifically the expertise of many zoological professionals, including our very own here from SeaWorld. So thanks guys, and thanks Pete and Penny for joining us today. Watch, she'll follow him off. Hey, where are you going? Wait for me. Hey, stop. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of rescues, I wanted to highlight a couple of other rescues as well. We work with many organizations around the world besides doing our own rescues here at SeaWorld. We've rescued 24,000 animals at SeaWorld, but we also support organizations like the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey, which is where little Henry came from. Henry is one of the smallest species of owl in the world. Anybody know what type of an owl it is? Oh, you know what? We're going to have that great horned owl up next, but what species is this? Anybody want to give it another guess? It's not a burrowing owl, it's a screech owl. Yeah, so there are eastern and western screech owls. This is an eastern screech owl. They're found all the way across the United States. And this is full grown. This is not a baby. So, little Henry here was actually uh, rescued after it was found. He was found after a storm. And what happened is it looks like he broke his beak in the storm after the fall. And unfortunately, he's got a little bit of a crossed beak, so it makes it much harder for him to hunt and forage for himself. So Audubon Center for Birds of Prey actually gave us a call and said, we've got a little bird here who needs a forever home. And we said, we've got a forever job for him if he'd like it. And that's as one of our precious animal ambassadors. So little Henry here is a great animal ambassador because here's an example of an animal that could basically be living in your own very own backyard. Something that you guys can do to help these little guys is by making sure that we don't just automatically cut down old dead trees. That's where these guys nest. They need those little holes. And if you don't have any old dead trees that you can preserve, then you can put up an owl box instead. That would help these guys as well as our next owl, which is what? The Great Heart Owl, that's right. So we're gonna have Owl Fred. Did you get it? Owl Fred? <laughs> Come out next. And Owl Fred is also a rescue. Now, Owl Fred has a slightly different story because Owl Fred was apparently found by somebody in the wild and they thought that they could take care of it. Unfortunately, Owl Fred became imprinted, which means he thought he was a person rather than an owl, and so unfortunately couldn't be returned to the wild. He is now one of our ambassador animals as well, but it's a good lesson for everybody because there's a little bit of natural history that goes here as well. When owls are growing up from being little owlets that the parents take care of, and before they are totally flighted and can take care of themselves, they actually sit on the branches near buck nest. The parents, the parents are taking care of them and feeding them still, but sometimes, because they're kind of fluttering around a little bit, they end up on the ground. Well, if you think you see an owl on the ground that is in need of help, rather than going and getting them yourself, keep an eye on him so that he doesn't get hurt by a dog or a cat, but call the rescue experts, either here at SeaWorld or your local uh, organization. Because many times you can actually put the owls right back in the nest or near the nest because the parents will continue to feed them. As a matter of fact, Maria, that you think is very safe for the owl, the parents will actually also feed them on the ground as well. So you don't have to worry about them and they can maintain their wild status 
out in uh, the Florida suburbs right there, because that's exactly where all these guys came from. So this is your typical classic owl, right? He does the hoo, 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 like that. You know, this little screech owl does a very different sound. He's got a little bit of a trill or scream that you might hear. Barn owls have a different sound. But if you ever hear of an owl in the movies, what sound do you always hear, no matter what species it is? Yes, the woo woo. So everybody has considered that that's the classic owl sound, no matter what species of owl it is. And he's got those great uh, feather tufts too. And a very perfect example of uh, what a classic owl uh, silhouette also looks like. But those tufts are not ears. They're actually just ways that the owl communicates. He actually is excited and interested when he has them up and maybe, maybe uh, a little fearful if he has them down. And it's also a way to camouflage himself. So the classic owl right there and owls that you would find in your own backyard. Hopefully you've seen them because they're awesome pest protectors too. Oh, pest protectors, oh my goodness. Pest, uh, ex whatever you call it, exterminators. There we go. <laughs> All right, well, thank you to Alfred and to Henry, as well as to Bree and Marshall for bringing them out. Thanks, you guys. All right, now, how many of you guys thought that that was a huge owl? That's a pretty good size owl. Well, isn't it? Yep, but guess what? We have the largest species of owl in the world that's coming up next. And it's actually going to fly right over your heads, all right? Alira was just placed on a box by Jess back there. She is a Eurasian eagle owl. Eurasian eagle owls range from Europe. And she is going to her six-foot wingspan and show you and listen for that silent flight. Here we go, Alira. Todd is up here calling her. She's looking backwards. She's looking forwards. She... There she is. Woo! That was awesome! <laughs> Great job, Alira. Alira, believe it or not, is just one year old. She's full grown. They've got that huge wingspan. That she's doing something called a little bit of mantling there. She's not quite up. She goes, where's my food? I can't see it. They're a little bit of nearsighted uh, owls are. So when she looks down, sometimes she can't quite see her food. They have very good eyesight, obviously, at a distance. A hundred times better or more if it's nighttime, because that's how she pinpoints her prey. That and her hearing, which is also exceptional. She has ears that are actually offset so that she can triangulate and figure out exactly where her prey is going. An owl this size can bring down a small deer. <laughs> yeah, that's like awesome. I mean, not really awesome, but you know what I mean. It's like amazing. Uh, so, Alira here at just one year old is a fantastic flyer. She is she could actually live to be almost 60 years old because she's taken care of so well in our zoological facilities. In the wild, they probably average in their 20s. So we're gonna watch Alara as she finishes up here and then she's gonna look towards Jess again so that she can fly off. So one more time, you're gonna get a chance to see that amazing flight. The reason that they can fly silently is owl feathers are very, very soft. If, you, if you've ever done the uh, zipper thing with most feathers, right? They have like little hooks and barbs so that they're stiff. Owl feathers are very, very soft so that the wind basically, or the air basically just flows through them and that's how they can fly so silently. So thank you, Alira, Jess, and Todd for bringing Alira out from SeaWorld in San Diego to show off her great behavior. Alright, well now we're going to go to our brown camouflaged owls that live in our own backyard to the one of the most flamboyant animals you have ever seen. Thank you so much. There we go. Is that a little bit better? <laughs> Alright, we're going to go to listen, listen for the back of the room because here come the flamingos, right? Those adorable pink creatures. 
which are going to make their way. Now, I love the Flamingo Parade because you know why? Because the Flamingos love the Flamingo Parade. We open the door to the Flamingo uh, Habitat and we just ask, which ones want to go for a walk? And they all come running out. I do, I do, I want to go for a walk. And so we love it because they love it. And this is really enriching for them. They get a chance to see, oh, where are they going? <laughs> Of course, <laughs> they get a chance to uh, to go down through the aisles and uh, meet, get a chance to meet everybody. Now, a lot of people know a lot about flamingos, so there's a few things that I just wanted to point out. <laughs> the one guy's like, "Hey, here we go, you met us the wrong way." <laughs> uh, the males are slightly taller than the females, generally speaking. <laughs> And these guys are all on the younger side, so they're just starting out, and that's why this is kind of particularly fun for them. And it's also fun for all of our trainers here, which are showing them, hey, hey, don't come out here this way. Um, you see, they're really unusual and interesting beaks. Uh, I think most of you realize that they eat by putting their head down in the shallow water. They live in very shallow areas and in lakes and in wetlands in many different parts of the world. There's six different species of flamingos. These are Caribbean or American flamingos. One of the most colorful and one of the largest species. Where do they get their color? Shrimp. From the shrimp, but you know what it is? It's the beta carotene, which is also found in carrots, which is what causes their color to be so pink like that. So they eat algae and the shrimp and other uh, crustaceans that they eat, that all gives them that uh, beta carotene. So if you eat too many carrots, that's what you're going to look like. Oh, no. A little bit. <laughs> all right, well, that was our Flamingo Parade. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. I love those guys. All right. You know, before we go on, I do want to mention, I didn't realize we had another special guest in the audience, and uh, you may not want to be recognized. Um, but we have, uh, and many folks here may not realize, but we had a trainer here, uh, Don Brancho, who worked with the whales and was basically an inspiration to us all. And unfortunately, we lost her about five years ago. And I would like to recognize that I see that her mom is here, Marion. So Marion, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. So thank you. Don was my inspiration. Um, all right, so I'm going to bring out another animal, this one being the nation's symbol and a terrific conservation story. I can tell by the reaction that Maddie, our bald eagle, is on her way out with Alex here and okay so I realized in the earlier show that we had a bit of confusion so I've got to explain this right because Maddie is a bald eagle but it's not the big guy in blue all right <laughs> it, even though it's called a bald eagle Maddie is the one with the white head all right but the old English word for bald is actually, I mean, I'm sorry, the old English word for white is actually bald. So, so it gets a little, oh, she's gonna go. That's a good sign. Oh, yes! Oh, did I call it or not? <laughs> so, so Maddie here also has her rescue story, and I want to tell that story because she was blown out of the nest, kind of like little Henry there, and she broke her wing. And she was also rehabilitated here locally by Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. And they called us and said, you know, we have an eagle. This is a very special bird, and it needs very special care. And we know that you guys can provide it. And Alex here has been working with Maddie since she arrived, and they have a great relationship. Maddie trusts him and knows that he is going to take care of her, so she loves coming and being a part of these presentations. Bald eagles in general are great symbols for our country because they are so majestic. They live near rivers, lakes, and streams. They go fishing using those really strong talons where they can just grab a fish right out of that stream and bring it up onto land. They are monogamous. They have the same mate year after year, and in fact, 
used the same nest site year after year. And just like many of us, we want to make sure that our home is in the best condition possible every year. They redo, they add to it, they make it bigger and better because that's where they care for their young. And it's an important place that they do that. As a matter of fact, there was a pair of eagles that over a period of about 40 years, they used the same site. And scientists, uh, they estimated and they weighed parts of this, uh, they were able to weigh parts of this nest. Can you tell me how much you think that nest weighed that the scientists found? 400 pounds is a good guess. 1,000 pounds. 200. Those are good guesses because those would be huge nests, right? Guess what? It was 4,000 pounds. 4,000 pounds. That's how important their home is to them. And that's why it's so important that we realize that we need to share this earth with animals like the bald eagle and earlier with our flamingos and our owls and even our penguins. Because our actions as humans have a really big impact on whether animals are going to be able to survive or not. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Building birdhouses and keeping up old trees is just one. Making sure that we buy sustainably harvested resources like fish, because that will help the penguins, or wood, because that would help not only bald eagles, but all of our rainforest animals as well. Look for certified products. Make sure you don't use plastics when you don't need to, because so many plastics end up in the wrong spots. And many plastics are just one-time use, and that's almost the worst. You use a knife, a fork, a plate, a cup, one time, and then you throw it away. Guess what? That doesn't break down for hundreds and thousands of years in some cases. So think about the products and the materials that you use, and think about how we can make best decisions so that these animals can survive into the future. And Maddie is a great example of being able to make a difference for an animal that was once very nearly extinct, at least in the lower 48 states. But luckily, we paid attention to the fact that we were using pesticides that were affecting bald eagles and other birds of prey and other animals. We paid attention to the fact that we were losing habitat that they needed in order to survive and build those huge nests that they live in. We paid attention to the fact that we need to educate people that they are not competing with us, but they are living with us. And if we know all those things and we can do that thing for a bald eagle and bring them back from, uh, from being threatened to extinction, then we can do that for any other species that we want to and put our mind to. So just think about that next time you pick up that plastic fork or you drive a, a car uh, and, and it's uh, spewing uh, smoke out the back or, or you're turning on the water faucet um, unnecessarily, that those are the same resources and that's the same air that everybody breathes. And we can make small sacrifices so that animals as proud and as majestic as this can survive. So thank you, Alex, and thank you, Maddie, for being wonderful animal ambassadors. All right, so we're at the point where I'm going to bring out the absolute best special surprise you have ever seen, right? Okay, so I had the opportunity a few years ago to go to Antarctica. I've been fortunate enough to travel to every continent and see animals in the wild and, and see how they are surviving and watch their conservation and the people that are helping them. But when I went to Antarctica, one thing was really clear, that these animals are in one of the harshest places on Earth and they are surviving, even though it's a harsh world. And then I come back here and I see our Antarctic exhibit and go, wow, that's a really good recreation of what it's like down there. But you know what? Those birds inside are really pampered in comparison. Yeah, so you know what? We're going to bring out one of our newest chicks right now. This is Cliff, a little rock hopper chick that is just five weeks old. He was hatched from parents right in our exhibit. And you know what? TJ, I've got to hold this microphone because the other one's not working, so we'll get some really good shots of Cliff here. Just five weeks old, and you know what? Um, I'm going to show you how he started. This is a rock hopper egg. So just five weeks ago, he hatched out of this thing, right? And 
How long do you think it's going to be before he's full grown? And he get another year. So yeah, that seems like it should be right. But guess what? Yeah, in about in about five, four or five more weeks, he's going to be full grown. Penguin chicks change so rapidly because they have to survive in a very harsh world. So if they don't get their waterproof down feathers, if they don't get big and strong so they can go out fishing for themselves, they're never going to make it. So that's why penguins are very well cared for as best as possible by their parents. But what are their parents having to do? Their parents don't just go to the grocery store down the street. They've got to go fishing. And they have to go fishing sometimes really far. So they leave these this chicks this size in crushes. Now you saw that in the in the movie right before the penguin video. They're called crushes because all of the penguin chicks that are that same age all get together and they huddle together for protection. And then when the parents come back with the fish, they have to find their own chick and feed their own chick. And those are the ones that survive, the parents that make it out and back and out and back and out and back until these guys are old enough to survive on their own. So it better be fast because that's a lot of work. <laughs> All right, well, you know what? We've had about a dozen different penguin chicks uh, hatch out this year, this season so far. You can see some of those over at Antarctica. If you look really closely, and I am told by these penguin experts that a good place to look is at the big window and that there are a couple of Gen 2 chicks that are actually underneath the parents right now that you can probably see at that window. There's also a king chick and a few others in there. And there's a penguin party that's starting at 3.30 to 5 today that is just for you guys, so you can go over there and the Magellanic penguins are out there. And little Cliff will be back uh, being taken care of by his keepers at that point, but uh, you might see TJ wandering around there a little bit. So, you know what? Thank you for coming and listening to all of our um, information about the animals today. Thank you most of all for being caring people who love animals and are going to do their best for the wildlife that we all share. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you're enjoying Wild Days Weekends. Don't forget to join us at Antarctica from 3.30 to 5.30 for our ice block party to celebrate Penguin Lovers Weekend. Also.